There we go. We are recording. So great. So as Bucky said, I've been grappling with this for actually quite a while, but intensively since the 2018 election when so many of you and so many others worked so hard and we still really almost went backwards in terms of vote totals to try to understand what the origins of this urban rural divide are. And, and, and let me say a few things up front before I get into this. Um, first off, tonight will be really my best, uh, my best estimation of how we got here, the roots of the problem. And you're gonna hear me talk about six different underlying causes. We will not talk about solutions tonight, but we will, that will be the focus of the second session next week. So if you find yourself frustrated that we're not talking about solutions, please understand that that will be what we're, we're doing um, on October 13th. I'll also say this, just to be very clear. This presentation is targeted to people like you and I on this call. It is targeted to liberals, to progressives, to Democrats. It is intended specifically to be a challenge to us. So I am not going to spend time talking about our egomaniacal, insane president. I'm not going to be talking about Fox News or Breitbart or the QAnon conspiracy. We have manifest craziness and we have a very, very well-funded 40-year effort to degrade our democracy and to set citizens against each other and cultivate the worst possible impulses uh, amongst our people. We know all that. There's people talking and writing about that. I'm focusing on basically what have we um, done to contribute to this or where have we gone wrong. So please understand that I'm by no means saying uh, those other things aren't major contributors. So I also want to mention this and I'll bring it up again at the end. Bucky has been putting a link to this guidebook in the uh, emails he's been sending out. This is something I compiled just before I did the first presentation back in May. I've updated it a little bit, but this is a compilation of about 35 or 36 articles from 20 dif different authors. I'm one of them, but some of the best writers and thinkers on this question. And you'll hear me quote a number of them tonight, but this guidebook, if you, if you find this interesting and you want to dig deeper, I think this is a good place to begin. And all of the articles are um, by links. So there's no cost to you and you can kind of do it a little bit at a time. So this is our focus for tonight, our first half. How the heck did we get here to this place of such vitriol and such a divide? Well, the first of the six underlying causes I'm gonna posit is that the economy simply hasn't worked for most Americans. Now we talk a lot about the 1% or the one-tenth of 1% and that's certainly true. Those are the folks that have done spectacularly well. But the, the truth is when you look at the economic data that actually the top 20% of wage earners have basically done pretty well for the last 40 years. And so it's really the bottom 80%, which is to say the vast majority of Americans, working folks, most middle class people, and certainly the poor, for whom the economy has not been working for a very long time. We know this from all kinds of indicators. Here's, here's one of them. This is a graph that shows us the increase in uh, the US population from the year Ronald Reagan was elected, 1980, to almost the present, uh, 2016. Uh, our population grew from 230 million to 320 million, about a 42% increase. During that exact same period of time, adjusted down for inflation, um, our economy grew uh, almost threefold. So look at those again. That's The population grew a wee bit. The economy grew dramatically. And when we say the economy grew, we mean, uh, when we say it grew almost threefold, that means there's almost three times as much business being conducted, three times as much goods and services being produced and sold, three times as much money moving through the economy. So if the population just grew by 40%, but the economy nearly tripled in size, why aren't most of us much better off? That 80%, why aren't we? And there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Everything from the fact that the vast majority of the return 
now goes to capital, to owners of capital rather than to laborers and a lot of other things. Uh, we're not going to get too deeply into that. But here's the point that I want to make. Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was a terrible thing that only exacerbated this income and wealth inequality. But the fact of the matter is, it's been brewing and expanding relatively steadily for the last 40 years, including through 16 years of Democratic presidents. Robert Reich put it this way, the way it was before Trump brought us Trump. The way it was before Trump was an economy rigged for the benefit of the few, stagnant wages, socialism for the rich, and harsh capitalism for everyone else. So there's no question that there's a significant difference in the parties. I am not one who says the Democrats and the Republicans are just the same and it doesn't matter who you vote for. That's, that's been false and it's certainly false now. And it's also certainly true that Republicans have been the ones to push the most anti-labor agenda, the most pro-corporate agenda, and pro-corporate supreme justices, no doubt about it. Yet, it was Bill Clinton's administration that eliminated the Glass-Steagall Act, which had separated investment functions, which are much riskier, from banking functions. And when Clinton and, and the Republicans did that in the late 90s, they opened the door to all kinds of financial shenanigans, uh, default swaps, derivatives that almost destroyed the economy and still are a huge problem today. That's one example. Another is the fact that during President Obama's eight-year tenure, the head of the antitrust division uh, let virtually every merger of any consequence proceed, including several involving big pharma. So my point here is to say that, yes, the Republicans are worse on all these issues, but if you consider yourself a Democrat or a liberal, we've got to own our own role in this mess. Within a larger context of the economy not working for the vast, vast majority of Americans, the reality is that that's even more the case in rural areas. This study from the American uh, Center for American Progress just came out not long ago, put it this way, that the net change in the number of businesses in following the Great Recessions, basically there was zero growth in new businesses overall in rural communities, while um, there was not dramatic but significant growth in new business startups and business expansion in metropolitan areas, particularly in the 20 largest metro areas. Same way around wages. Wages grew more than three times as fast for people working in urban areas compared with those in rural areas. So you can begin to see that the average person, and particularly the average working person in rural areas, um, is pretty legit when they start to say the economy isn't working for them. It's further exacerbated by, as I mentioned, uh, President Obama's um, antitrust chief did practically nothing to start, stop mergers and monopolization, but that trend has also been uh, going on for a good 30 plus years. The lack of enforcement of antitrust laws that have been on the books, and this is critically important. So we end up with going from 50 media companies to five media companies, owning 90% of the airwaves. And in rural areas, we end up with mega giants like Tyson and IBP and a handful of others who pretty much dominate everything uh, to do with agricultural economy. And so that farmers who want to play in the game and who are a little bit bigger than the kinds of niche farmers we have in Southwest Virginia, like myself, uh, they find themselves between a rock and a hard place uh, with the kinds of practices and the kinds of return they get from this. Claire Kellaway, who does some outstanding writing on rural issues, in an article she published last year, she put it this way, farmers are caught between monopolized sellers and buyers. They must pay ever higher prices to the giants who dominate the market for the supplies they need, like seed and fertilizer, and at the same time, they must accept ever lower prices from the giant agribusinesses that buy the stuff they sell. So that's exactly the situation that uh, certainly most midsize uh, farmers, whether they're dairymen, cattle, grain, uh, or produce, find themselves in. 
And so the net is that, like the rest, so many other rural occupations, both farmers and farm workers find themselves squeezed with poor returns for farming and low wages for farm workers. So, so that's, the, that's the first leg of this six-legged table around how we've gotten to this divide. The second is around this, what has become extraordinarily widespread, I think around the nation, but particularly in rural areas, this anger against elites. And it, it, it builds on and to a degree is justified by this long-term economic decline and a sense that the system is doing fine for others. It's protecting others, but not me. Um, one of the people I mentioned in my guidebook is Catherine Kramer, who wrote a book called The Politics of Resentment. And she spent uh, the better part of five years interviewing rural people in several different uh, places around Wisconsin, trying to understand how Scott Walker had come to power and retained power. And most of her lessons, I think, fit on a national level. And what she found consistently was that people in the country identified elites basically as folks in the city, liberals, Democrats, intellectuals. And the sense was that those people didn't care about the lives of everyday people, of working folks. And so it, it created this politics of resentment. In, uh, not in her book, but in an article that Catherine wrote, she brought up the issue, which we all know better now than we have for some time, about the role of race. And there's, again, it, absolutely unquestionable what a substantial role race and racism, both historically and at this present moment, play in all of this. There's simply no way around this. But Catherine says that although it's a part of this resentment, we're failing to fully understand these perspectives. And she's talking now about these rural people uh, that she interviewed over five years, when we assume that racism is more fundamental than calculations of injustice. The two elements are intertwined. The way these folks described the world to me, their basic concern was that people like them in places like theirs were overlooked and disrespected. They were doing what they perceived good Americans ought to do to have a good life, and it seemed to be passing them by. And as a part of that sense of being disrespected, as you see in the rest of the quote, she felt that the only time rural people kind of came into the conversation for uh, city folk uh, was when they were ridiculed as uneducated racists. That elitism, um, we all know Trump is a master of exploiting. And so he has, uh, from his first campaign um, uh, days right through to the present, been consistent in his attacks on, on who he paints as elites. He, the ultimate economic New York elite insider, plays into this anti-elitism um, in part by attacking scientists, intellectuals, people in democratic cities, and, and particularly the experts, right? He, he goes, talks a lot about not trusting the experts. So people on, in our way of thinking, most liberals, most people with a, with a lot of formal education tend to think, but you know, what's wrong? People should listen to the experts, whether it's Dr. Fauci, whether it's the folks telling us about climate change and emissions data. And I'm in complete agreement with that. But I want to remind us that in addition to all of the energy the right expends to create this anti-expert culture, it's also true that the experts are not always right. Bill Clinton and his treasury secretary, Robert Rubin, both were just huge proponents of NAFTA and of the World Trade Organization and the entry of China into the WTO. They promised us that NAFTA would create a million new jobs over the next five years, but it didn't work out that way. And when, when Alan Greenspan in, in the late 90s, when there was a movement to start regulating these derivatives, these weird agglomerations of debt and embedding against success that became the largest part of Wall Street in the trillions of dollars. When, when people started making waves to say, hey, we need to regulate those things, Alan Greenspan led the charge to ensure that derivatives, in fact, were not going to be regulated. 
assuring us that that would be fine because the market was self-regulating. And it wasn't until 2008, in the middle of the economic collapse, that he said uh, that maybe people like himself were not quite right. So the anti-expert thing, which has a lot of dimensions to it, is I think we also need to recognize that, that people can look to examples of where the experts were wrong and a lot of folks got screwed in the process. Another element of this anti-elitism that Catherine Kramer found very commonly among rural people was the sense that jobs that required physical labor were real jobs, whereas jobs that were desk jobs, whether it was uh, somebody working for a big corporation or uh, even a school teacher, they, they consistently looked at those desk jobs with um, a certain amount of both resentment and a sense that they weren't real work. They, some people said, all they produce is ideas, not real things. Now, again, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's a fair and reasonable assessment. People working at so-called desk jobs, white collar jobs, work very, very hard. But I do, as a farmer, have some sense of understanding about how when so much of the working population has shifted away from physical labor, and all that that entails in terms of wear and tear to the body and risk, um, I can see how that resentment towards white collar workers who are more in the city than in the country begins to arise. So again, another thing contributing to that anti-elite sentiment. The third foundational cause is this idea, it's, it's, it's part of the larger anti-government sentiment that has been uh, part of the American psyche for since our beginning, but has really been cultivated since Barry Goldwater. But of, over the last 15 or 20 years, it's this idea that regulations don't help everyday people. This is part, as I said, of a broader decline in trust of the government, which has been precipitous. Um, I'm gonna share one story from actually my first campaign in 2012 after a little uh, house event in Carroll County, Virginia, and I was milling about with a couple dozen people who had attended, there was a woman there who identified herself as a small business owner. And uh, in fact, she owned a little retail store in the community. And um, she and I started to chat and she looked at me and she said, look, if you get elected, there's just one thing I want from you, just one thing. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, leave me alone. So this sentiment that the government is intrusive and that regulations specifically and particularly are intrusive on farmers, on small businesses, on the lives of everyday people is, is very strong and stronger, I would say, among farmers, small businesses, and, and those kinds of folks in rural communities. Now, of course, the irony here, there's anti-regulatory sentiment in a lot of ways um, around the banking industry, around health, around worker safety, but this, it's strongest and most consistent around environmental regulations. And, and the terrible irony is it's the people in rural communities, whether they're fishermen or farmers or loggers, uh, even miners and, and gas drillers, but they're the people who are working. We're the people who are working closest to the environment. We're the people who most need a healthy, fully functioning ecosystem with, with healthy soils, et cetera. And yet that's where that anti-environment sentiment is almost uh, most consistent and strongest. So where would that come from besides the stoking of it um, from the other side? Well, first, this idea that, that regulations don't help the little guy, like some other things, has at least some basis in reality. Many of you in Southwest Virginia, for sure, remember 10 years ago, the upper Big Branch mine disaster in West Virginia. It was a massy coal operation. 29 miners were killed in the explosion. In the month before the explosion, Massey was cited with over 60 safety violations. In the year preceding the explosion, Massey received over 500 safety violations. Nothing of significance was done with those safety violations. And so the end result was 
29 minors were killed. And from a perspective of a surviving spouse or a person in the community, you can understand why maybe they think, you know, regulations, they, they just really don't work. They don't protect the little guy. That's sentiment is, is continued. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of Arlie Hochschild's experience talking to folks in rural Louisiana about that, um, that sense that regulations don't work. Arlie, her book is called Strangers in Their Own Land. And I read that several years ago, another one that I highly recommend. But, but Arlie spent her time uh, talking to people uh, much as Catherine Kramer did in Louisiana. She did it in rural Louisiana. Catherine was in Wisconsin. She's a Berkeley trained uh, sociologist, but she got to know about a dozen households and spent time with them several days or a week or more at a time, spaced out over about five or six years. And they came to trust her and vice versa. And what Arlie was trying to understand is why did almost all, not all, but almost all of these people she got to know regularly vote for state representatives and federal representatives who were pushing to further deregulate the pesticide, petrochemical, and plastics industry that were upwind and upstream from them. These were folks who had extremely high rates of cancer, all kinds of illness in their families. They almost couldn't fish anymore because the bayous had been so poisoned. And they had no doubt about where it was coming from. They knew it was coming from these factories. And yet, they kept voting for further deregulation of them. And Arlie was trying to understand this in, in her interviews and her book. And what she found was that fundamentally, people felt really that they had been displaced or overlooked or passed by, and they ended up blaming others, particularly people of color, for butting in the line. Again, that sense that we've played by the rules, now we're getting screwed and other people are getting the advantages. It's not true, but that's the sense. And so it, it, it cultivates this, this culture of, of grievance and of defensiveness, which can easily become outrage. One of the gentlemen in one of the households she talked to, she, she pinned him down on why it was that he was um, still gonna vote for Trump. This was pre-Trump, but he was gonna vote for him and, and um, the conservative for Congress. And she said, but don't you understand, you, you know that they're gonna further deregulate these industries and they're killing you and your family. Why, why, why are you doing that? And he said, here's the way I see it. If I'm out on my boat and I spill a gallon of oil into the, into the bayou, the regulators will be all over me. I'll get fined, I might get my boat taken away. If that company spills 100,000 gallons of oil, nothing ever happens to it. So again, much like the Big Branch disaster, there's this sense that regulations, maybe they're supposed to protect workers and health and the community, but they don't. Another sense of this, or another kind of element of this sense of being strangers in their own land is the sense of being besieged. And this comes from Erica Edelson's book, Beyond Contempt. She interviews a woman who grew up in a conservative religious household in the South, who over time became herself more of a liberal. And so she was able to kind of understand both sides. And she told Catherine, she said, I know it's hard to believe that a member of the dominant race and or religion of the country could honestly consider themselves a besieged underdog. But people really believe this it's actually very easy to believe that your own small town or local religious community is an isolated pocket of sanity in a hedonistic liberal world. So again, I'm, I'm not agreeing with the underlying sentiments, but this is a woman who now identifies as a liberal who's saying, if you think it's crazy that sort of white Christians feel like they're the ones under siege, you have to understand this sense of being an island in an otherwise hostile world. Sarah Smarsh in her book, Heartland, said something similar. So she was the first person in her family to go to college. She was, grew up in a rural working class family in Kansas. Um, father did uh, sort of a variety of jobs. They had a small farm, struggled like crazy to just get by. 
and she made it off to college. And most of her college mates at the University of Kansas were from more well-to-do families, and most of them were from town. They were from urban areas. And when she would talk about how she grew up, this is how she said they reacted. They would say to her, I haven't heard anything like that since the grapes of wrath. That's how people understood her existence growing up on a hard scrabble farm. And she said, these folks thought we didn't exist anymore when in fact we just existed in places that they never went. So that sense of being overlooked uh, in rural areas. Now the fifth underlying cause, and you can certainly, I hope, see how these things kind of link together and build on each other, is that I believe that in so many ways, we liberals, progressives, Democrats, however we might identify ourselves on this call, that we've often played right into this, right into this narrative, this narrative of, elite, of elitism, of contempt, um, of a disinterest except to ridicule. And I'm going to look at two parts of that, uh, how we've played into it. The first is just a fundamental shift in the Democratic Party's orientation. It didn't start with Barack Obama. It, some people say it started with Jimmy Carter. It certainly accelerated under Bill Clinton. But the shift to a party that was more steeped in and more associated with and surrounded by working folks, labor leaders, um, that kind of a constituency to uh, leaders of the Democratic Party that were entirely comfortable with the Bill Gates and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. In another article that Erica wrote, How Liberals Left the Working Class Behind, some of you might have read that in advance, she quotes uh, Larry Summers, who was influential for, on both Bill Clinton, uh, going back to NAFTA, and um, Barack Obama. And, and Larry Summers said that displaced white workers weren't heavily on our radar screen, is the quote. He said, noting that the Democratic Party base is a coalition of cosmopolitan elite and diversity. So Larry Summers' cosmopolitan elite are, are the very highly educated middle and upper class people who travel the world, live in sort of liberal enclaves that are ethnically diverse, that are usually more economically vibrant, and they have uh, the opportunities of globalization. For them, the benefits are myriad, but the downsides are invisible. It isn't just a question of association, it's quite pragmatic as well. Uh, Trump ran on the pledge to drain the swamp. We all know he's expanded the swamp dramatically. But the truth is that key people in Barack Obama's administration went right from positions of trying to hold power to account to the very lobbying firms and private, um, uh, private attorney firms like Covington and Burling that fight the regulations, that fight the actions against white collar crime. Eric Holder, who of course was the Attorney General, Lanny Brewer was his deputy in charge of antitrust. They both went immediately from their tenure with the Obama administration to Covington and Burling, which turned right around trying to loosen the screws that might be applied to the biggest, richest Wall Street banks and corporations. Marilyn Tavener, who was the head of the Medicare and Medicaid Services Administration, immediately went to become a health insurance lobbyist. And Debbie Feinstein, who was his lead person in antitrust, again, went to a private firm that lobbied against antitrust. So, so Thomas Frank puts it this way, the Democratic Party is now the party of the professional class, not the working class. Michael Lind, in his book, The New Class War, says essentially the same thing. He refers to the Democratic Party's primary constituency as the managerial overclass the people who make the rules, the people who implement the agenda, the people who tell us what to do and not to do. The other piece of this fundamental shift in the alternative party, the alternative party to the Republicans, since we've not been able to build a strong third party, 
is the language that we use. And next week, we're gonna talk a great deal about language, how to, how to improve it dramatically um, if we're gonna be able to communicate with folks. But this was just a tiny sampling of some of what says. Uh, Marcos, the, Marcos uh, Melitsis, who is the founder of Daily Coast, he said, be happy for coal miners lo losing their health insurance. They're getting exactly what they voted for. And Paul Krugman referred to people voting for Trump as chumps and losers. So you can begin to see that folks' anti-elitism didn't come out of the blue. The last piece I wanna mention is the myth of centrism. So again, I, I'm sure we've got uh, folks on this call with different beliefs about the direction the Democratic Party should have gone in this election that's coming up. But whether you are a Bernie person or a Warren person or a Biden person, there is this reality that for most of the last uh, 40 years of elections, the alternative party, the Democratic Party, has pushed this idea that we must come down in the middle and that our solutions must be incremental. We can't have radical solutions. Um, this idea that we have to do this is based on the, on the notion that folks that we're trying to win over who aren't already in the choir with us must see us as moderate that we have to put forward proposals that improve the system, but never too fast, never too radically. And in his book, Merge Left, Ian Haney Lopez really refutes that very, very well. He talks about a new approach where we fuse race and class to win elections. And he's tested this in the field, but in, in scores of interviews and a lot of survey data, what he found was that Basically, there's a camp of people that's uh, deeply committed to a left-leaning progressive agenda. There's another camp that's deeply on the right with Trump. And then there's a chunk in the middle that he considers to be persuadable. What he found with this group in the middle that's, that's somewhere around 55 to 60% of the population was not that they were looking for messages of moderation, not that they were looking for minor tweaks to the system. In fact, many of them were utterly fed up with the system and the status quo and the establishment. What they wanted was they wanted attention to their particular needs and situations, and they wanted respect. And he also found that frequently they had contradictory views on a particular topic, whether it was healthcare, immigration, or other things. He found that they had both right-leaning views and left-leaning views at the same time, the same people. And that the messages of moderation, of trying to thread the needle, that you don't really challenge the status quo, did not work with these folks. But messages, bold messages, about really addressing the problem and doing it in this kind of race class way were in fact the most effective messages for this group in the middle. The election results of our lifetime, for the most part, also bear out, I think, the fallacy of, of centrism and uh, this idea of a moderate middle. And this is from Ibram X. Kendi, who talks about that overall, the Democrats have a losing record in terms of putting forward moderate Democrats. We've had basically three moderate Democratic candidates who won, Carter, Clinton, and Obama, um, and covered five terms altogether. Um, but six who were very moderate, uh, post-McGovern, who lost. So the idea that that's the winning electoral strategy has also been largely refuted by experience. Reinforcing some of what Ian Haney Lopez says is another author, Jonathan Metzl, who wrote Dying of Whiteness. And he, in speaking again to many, many, mostly rural, some urban white voters in Tennessee, Kansas, and um, one other state, he found that the way white voters, conservative white voters, heard GOP messages with that the GOP was saying, um, we glorify you for who you are, we accept you for who you are, but Democrats shame you for who you are and, and say that you are complicit in the historical and current problems of the country. 
Now, again, I think most of us on this call would say, we are. <laughs> we are. But the fact of the matter is that the messaging that comes from the right and from the Republicans is one that kind of, as Metzl puts it, frees people up to feel good about themselves and who they currently are. How do we change that? How do we go about doing that in such a way when people already feel backed into a corner? So that's my presentation. Um, we still have a good 45 minutes for conversation. I've put up again the guidebook. If you haven't already seen it, I think there's a link in the chat box. And I'm going to stop my screen share and just open it up to conversation. With Bucky's help, again, you can raise your hand and comment verbally. You can put something in to um, the chat box, and Bucky will bring it before the whole group. We need a bold person to break the ice. I'll be happy to break it, Anthony. Hey, Robert. Thank you for this presentation. I thought it was really great. Um, and I like how it's attempting to um, talk about, not attempting, it is a it's talking about the rural urban divide, which I think a lot of people aren't naming it that way, which I think is really helpful um, because um, I think young people in cities, I think this like professional class in cities um, um, and poor people in cities are beginning to really think differently about urban areas. I think 2016 really forced that. I want to name, I think, two things that I hear you saying and then I want, I want to kind of know why you don't name it this way, but also your thoughts around these two particular things. One of them is when I hear, um, your first point, the economy hasn't worked for most Americans. Like I'm hearing neoliberalism sucks and it kills us all. Um, and so maybe like why, why not talk about neoliberalism? Because I think like that language itself isn't like going to get like my grandmother and my, you know, my brother who've worked in factories their whole lives at the table. But I think that framework talks about their labor and talks about the types of work that disappeared because of these policies. And part of that is like the, the unions have disappeared also, right? So like, where, like maybe like why, why isn't that in here? But then the other thing I think I hear you talking a lot about and points um, four, five, and six really um, about identity politics. Um, the role of identity politics. Why have Democrats focused on identity politics? Um, how, why have we sort of bought into this idea of identity politics? But, and I think that has a lot to do with race, which I think I'm really happy to hear you saying this is super important. We can't forget about race. Um, so I'll just pause there to just throw those two things out and then um, maybe see if it helps spark any more conversation. That's great, Robert. Thank you. I'll, um... I'll try to respond briefly to them. So I think absolutely um, I could name that fundamental point about the economy and bring up neoliberalism and, and make clear that these trends in the United States are trends throughout most of the so-called developed world. This, this uh, growing inequality gap, it's most severe in the US, but the, the neoliberal approach to both national economies and the international economy are at the heart of it. So I think that's a good point and something to name. I, the only thing I would, I would caution about is um, neoliberal, neoliberalism sucks, absolutely, but I wouldn't say it's bad for all of us or it's killing all of us because we have to remember that it isn't just the 1%. It isn't just the wealthiest of the wealthy that are doing pretty well under the current system. It's really roughly the top 20%. That's an important distinction because that's a lot more people than 1%. And many of those 20 percenters are in fact in leadership positions in the Democratic Party, foundations and liberal institutions. Um, the identity politics politics issue is a good one. And, I, and I'm frankly looking for new and better ways to discuss this because it's so utterly critical to not minimize the role of race. And yet at the same time, um, 
I want to make clear that when the Democratic Party has isolated race sort of against class, uh, sort of putting it as more important than class, that has been, I think, a serious mistake, both in truth and in strategically. What people like Katherine Kramer are finding is that if you're going to talk about identity politics, there's a lot of working people in rural areas that identify as working people in rural areas. So it's almost its own identity. Anthony, Kel has raised a hand. Yeah. And Kel, when you speak, could you tell everybody else how to raise their hand? Anthony and I were trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't find that. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Um, to raise your hand, you go to your to your video. You click on your um, your the left the left hand side, and it should. Um, it should more should come up and it should give you the option of raising your hand. You see? Well, while folks are trying that, Kel, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, make your comment or question? Okay. I've been having a series of conversations with a friend of mine. She's a first time voter. She's, she's older than I am and she works at a restaurant here in town. She was so distressed by what she witnessed these last four years that she decided to register to vote. But I was gobsmacked the other day when she informed me she was going to vote for Trump. Now she despises Trump personally um, and she hates his policies. But she considers that he's more real than Biden. And I'm, I'm just at, at a lot, I've tried to counter this with, you know, facts as to, you know, it's how false he is and um but she gets her information solely from local television stations and i i really don't want to damage our friendship but i i'm at a loss here yeah yeah well, I mean, that is, that's astonishing, Kel, and I, I don't have an answer. I would say that everything I tried to convey in the last few minutes about the sort of roots and the depth and the breadth of this anti-elitism and how long before Trump, people on the right from Rush Limbaugh to Sean Hannity we're cultivating the notion that it's intellectuals, it's liberals, it's Democrats who are the elites. And then what we've done to play into that in terms of language, in terms of ignoring people's issues, in terms of what we prioritize and what we didn't, I would guess that your friend is somebody who has kind of been persuaded by that, that the real elites, the people that really diss me and don't care about me, who are not real, are are Democrats. And so I don't know how we undo that for her or for others, except over time. And we'll talk a lot about this next week about how we begin to change the perception of liberals and progressives and Democrats. But I think it's gonna take a long time to change that. You know, if if the revelations about Trump paying $750 in taxes at most over the last several years, the, the revelations about how he has dissed uh, soldiers and, and all of that, if that doesn't shake her and others from the sense that he's not really real, then I'm not sure that there's anything we can do in the short run. We have to kind of think longer term about it, would be my guess. Do we have long term? That's the thing. Yeah, well, that's a damn good question. <laughs> the short answer is no. 
Um, but I, I, so, I mean, I think many of us are working urgently on this election in a lot of ways, but we also need to think beyond the election towards, you know, a more governable society. As you said so well in your letter to the editor of last week, uh, whatever happens in the election, folks are still going to be my neighbor and I want to be their neighbor and I want to treat them with respect and compassion. So, um, this is part of that longer term, even though we, we really don't have much time. Okay. And Anthony Mary Jennings had a question. Go ahead, no, <laughs> I was just making the comment that um, if you have an iPad, you can find chat under the more category in the upper right hand corner. Oh. And um, there's a drop down menu that then has uh, chat as an option. And I was writing in uh, that. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Teresa, I'm not Teresa, Tessa has a question or a comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess I, I have two comments, um, maybe questions. You can take it, take it however you want to take it. Um, my first thought is, is sort of in what you were just talking about of, you know, the revelation of, of taxes having some sort of impact. And I can almost see, you know, given many of the things that you just brought up, that it would easily fall into the camp of this is why it's easier to be wealthy if we reduce regulations, right? So like pay less in taxes, be wealthier, be better off, right? So I could see how that go completely back the other way and that paying less in taxes just looks more and more like a good thing in, you know, in these spaces. Um, Something that I've kind of been thinking a lot about, I've been, um, I'm from, you know, rural, small farming community, but I've been studying in San Francisco the last couple of years. And something that I've noticed that uh, has really bothered me since 2008 and such a slow recovery in my own hometown that like not only has employment and money gone away and not come back, it's moved even farther, you know, out of the state entirely into these huge hubs within the country. And then there sort of gets it's being started to talk about that the reason the money and the opportunity are in these hubs is because that's where the innovation happens or that's where the best ideas happen. Not because the money is there making those ideas happen, but because that's where the best is. And it's drawing people like myself, young people, into those spaces to try and seek out education and opportunity. And then you see this like brain drain and this economic drain and then the lack of opportunity still in those spaces back home. And I know that's a little bit of that neoliberalism that we're talking about, but I also am seeing what you mentioned, Anthony, of people assuming that those cities are innovative because the people are better rather than they're innovative because that's where the money has retreated back to from, you know, globalization. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a question in there, but that's something that's been on my mind quite a bit. It's just sort of the systemic, the systemic flow of money and opportunity and the fact that I as an individual have to follow it because there just isn't an opportunity in my hometown anymore to stay there and that's forcing you know people like myself to keep moving that direction yeah those are really good very thoughtful points tessa i'll, I'll follow up with a couple of comments in terms of your first one about the it, it's almost like a vicious cycle of uh, sure trump didn't pay much in the way of taxes but as he says that's what wealthy people do they're just using the system the system is rigged you might as well take advantage of the rigged system the other element of that that might be and we have to keep in mind that there there does seem to be a tiny bit of erosion of support for Trump around the around the margins as all of these things accumulate, but it's pretty small as best as we can tell. But but part of the I would say the response about his taxes of not really caring also comes from again this incredibly strong sense 
that the government doesn't work, that the government is the problem, as Reagan put it, not the solution. And Reagan was the one to kind of bring that notion front and center. And then the Republican Party and the right wing has just beat that into us for uh, the last 40 years. And so if you believe that regulations don't really protect you, and the government hasn't done anything for you, even though you might have Medicaid or Medicare, but your sense is the government hasn't done anything for you, and the government seems to promote the interests of other people in places not like your places, like cities, then why would you think that taxation was a good thing? Why would you think that the government can solve the problems of your community? So I think a, a kind of an anti-government, uh, pervasive anti-government sense then feeds into this narrative that, well, it's fine if he didn't pay taxes because taxes are a waste anyway. In terms of your point about the kind of draw of um, well-educated, um, thoughtful innovators, and particularly young people to cities, it's, it's clearly a phenomenon. And there's, a, there's pretty good reasons for it as well. I mean, the, the fact is when you have a whole bunch of people in close proximity, you can generate and stimulate ideas that can bounce off of each other. It's sort of a, you know, big cities are kind of incubation hubs themselves. But it's also true that, that cities per capita have gotten much more government money in terms of investment in innovation, investment in space to foster innovation, investment in innovative businesses. There's, there's a real incentive package that plays out at local, state, and federal level. And it's disproportionately, even accounting for population, going to cities. There's actually quite a bit of extraordinary innovation going on in rural America. I tried to kind of talk about a little bit of that in the book I wrote. But it gets missed by the media and by public policymakers, and it gets underinvested in as well. So I don't think we'll ever have a situation where big cities aren't hubs of innovation and draws to, to innovative, uh, out-of-the-box thinkers. But I do believe that we could also have that in many small towns if the scales were equal on, on our investment and attention. Anthony, Donna wanted to oh, no. have a comment. Oh, no? No. Nope. Okay. All right. And Linda Mashburn. Well, I just reacted to one of your last comments about um, looking to more radical solutions and candidates rather than just moderates. And um, I have to admit, I'm reflecting on a major argument I had with my own daughter, who is an adamant Bernie Sanders um, <laughs> fan. Uh, because she knew because of my values and the way I raised her that they <laughs> were very congruent with uh, Bernie Sanders on a lot of issues and couldn't understand why I wasn't uh, backing his candidacy. And it's mainly my long-term experience with the defeat of George McGovern and Dukakis and other, um, uh, Humphrey, <laughs> you know, um, that having lived through those defeats, um, I, I keep thinking that a moderate has more of a chance politically. Yeah, and nobody knows the answer. Nobody knows for sure had Bernie gotten the nod this time, whether he'd be in a stronger position than Biden, who appears to be in a fairly strong position. I think there's a lot of pretty good reason to believe he would have fared dramatically better than Hillary Clinton four years ago against Trump, because many people in Southwest Virginia and other rural areas um, were e of equal interest in Bernie and Trump. They wanted an anti-establishment figure. So, but you know, who knows about exactly how that would have played out. But, but part of what I would challenge back just a little bit, Linda, is Dukakis and Humphreys, by my reading and by the people I read, were anything but radical, people in their proposition. They were lukewarm liberals, is what they were. And again, it, to the degree that the alternate party, the Democratic Party, puts forward people who are progressive on a range of very important social issues, but social issues that tend to be focused on subgroups of people, to the degree that that's where the progressivism is, 
but the conservatism and the lukewarm is around bread and butter economic issues, this is when we get our butts kicked. <laughs> okay. it, it's because, again, that plays into the narrative of they care about other people who are different from me and my community, but they don't care about how I'm going to make a living or that my kid can't find a job and is on drugs or whatever. So I think that Dukakis and Humphreys are examples of, of that that in, in an overall sense, I would call them moderates, even though socially they were probably quite liberal. Okay. Thank Anthony you. Tina, Tina McDaniels had something, has something to say. Great. Thank you, Bucky. Hello, Anthony. Hey, Tina. Uh, hi there. So my question is uh, around the current campaign and how well do you think the current presidential campaign has addressed the rural divide? Because I see, strong support of Donald Trump in our rural communities. And it seems his policies are not really for the rural community. So how well do you think um, that divide has been addressed in the current campaign? Oh, it's been, uh, that's a great question, Tina. I, I would say the only way it's been addressed is by Trump exploiting the existing base of frustration with the neglect that people in rural areas feel. Trump, there, there are fewer coal mining jobs today than there were when he took office, in spite of how huge uh, a deal he made out of bringing back coal. He's utterly failed on that. He's largely failed. You could make an argument that it's partly because of COVID, but even pre-COVID, his record on manufacturing jobs more broadly was lukewarm, about the same pace of, of adding back jobs as the last three years of the Obama administration. So Trump has done very poorly, uh, and then you could get into farmers and his trade policy and the skyrocketing suicides and bankruptcies among farmers. He has hurt rural areas. He's hurt the, some of the primary occupations of rural areas, but he still is able to exploit the sense that it's the other guys that are against you. And I think what Biden has missed, although a, a friend in Patrick County has asked me to really dive into Biden's rural plan that she says is quite good. And I'm going to do that this coming week and write about it. But at least on the stump speech, he'll talk about hardworking men and women and all that. But he rarely, rarely in my hearing brings up how rural areas in particular have not bounced back from the Great Recession and are in a, a multi-decade uh, struggle. And, and so here's what I think he should do and what I think all of us who consider ourselves liberals, Democrats, progressives should do is number one, begin by honestly and simply stating that both parties have, have screwed the 80% the of the population to different degrees and in different ways, but neither party has seen to it that everyday folks and working people really were their first priority. We have to own up to that. I get into arguments and I have people who critique me and what I write in my little newsletter that we should never, we should rally around the troops and not criticize um, Vice President Biden or any Democratic candidates. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. I don't think we have a chance in the world of opening a door with somebody who is not a hardcore Trumper, but is torn about which way to vote. I don't think we can open the door unless we admit that our party and our policies and our priorities have failed as well. Fail. And once we do that, and then if we can come forward with, if it is, a very strong plan for rural revitalization, which Biden may have, then we put that front and center and it sounds like an honest attempt to, to try again uh, with some integrity. Thank you. You bet, Tina. Anthony, Anita Manuel has her hand up. Hey, Anita. Is she gone? Ida, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Okay, so I made some notes to try to see if, because I'm coming from a slightly different place and not in the middle of this political conversation. Um, but I just wanted to interject this because I've gone into a place with other folks too, where we're really thinking about regeneration of systems of all kinds that we see collapsing. And that the basic thing has, is about 
resource extraction and that as human beings, we've actually just simply taken too much and are taking too much. And the natural systems are not working. The human systems are not working. People are completely aware that they're just having stuff taken from them and not having um, you know, a healthy way of living um, where they are. And I'm seeing, I'm not seeing you. Okay, I'm seeing Kel's name here. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm here. There you are. <laughs> um, so that uh, there's a lot of current collapse and more collapse on the way. That's the way that we really feel. And so we have to be thinking in really alternative ways. And that means politically as well, because if you think about politics as the way that human beings organize themselves to get things done, this system that we have right now feels like it's outdated that we really need to be doing other things. So people are working in various local places and I'm assuming, Anthony, that you're aware of some of those things and can name them, um, you know, to build new political structures, but that can actually recognize that the way that we um, don't just treat everything as resources, you know, so that's part of the rural problem is people just being treated as resources by everybody else instead of there being real bubble, little bubbles within bigger bubbles of economy. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with that at all. And I, in some respect, what you're talking about trying to figure out and then create or build this new system that is fundamentally not extractive but regenerative across all the different human needs is kind of what I've been doing for the last 40 years of my life and okay. writing about and speaking about. Absolutely. No, I think we need, we need that. The, the question is why the, this part of the question, because that, that's kind of my day job. That's, that's sort of what I usually do. But this piece that I'm trying to understand and, and grapple with is why is it that so many of the people who have been most harmed by the most extractive uh, mm -hmm. policies are not generally our allies in, in new arrangements, new policies that would create this new system. Some are, for sure. I mean, there's rural people, there's, there's tobacco farmers, I've worked with all kinds like that. But as a group, mm -hmm. those folks who've been hammered by the extractive economy, who've been treated as just a point in the economic equation by a big corporation, they're not on our side. And that's where I came to trying to understand where did it come to be that they identified with the most extractive um, elements politically and not with the folks that are trying to birth this new system. How did that, how did we get there? That's what this is about. So that as many people locally, nationally, some internationally continue to try to evolve this new regenerative system and that's going to be better for people and better for the environment, better for community, that, that it won't just be liberal elites developing that system, but we'll have partners among farmers and everyday folks. That's what I'm trying to get to. So I can't say that my sister is um, um, an everyday folk quite in that sense, but you know. I couldn't talk with her for a long time because she was involved in a, in a pretty basic evangelical Christianity. But it is the Christian language where we have our common crossing and that's what I use. And over time, um, I'm here, I'm fairly isolated here. And so in order to have some safety, we actually, I asked if she would do a daily check-in. She lives in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And, um, you know, it was, you know, a little difficult in the beginning, but it's getting easier because we really have been finding some common language to use, you know, and she has been shifting as things collapse. I mean, it's been really interesting with the COVID because, because she's a musician and, and they just lost their orchestra jobs just like that. And, um, and uh, she's been a Christian book editor and that stuff too kind of like went away and you know just went in in house and she couldn't get it anymore so 
having some kind of common language that can be used in new situations that are coming up. And we can actually talk now about COVID and post-COVID and post-COVID being different. But we're exploring the language that can be used to do that. That's good. And I hope you'll be able to participate next week because we will be yeah. starting at this point and beginning to talk about what we can do differently and better, one chunk of which will be around language. So that's great, Anita. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of people with their hands raised, but I wanted to go to the chat. There are a couple of questions there. Donna asked if besides your book, do you know of any resource that covers rural innovative businesses? She had seen some things on CBS Sunday morning in 60 Minutes. Uh, not on this rural urban divide, but specifically how to cultivate and build innovative rural businesses. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, let me, I can't think of a specific book off the top of my head, but, but I will bring ideas to the October 13th session. And let, let me suggest a couple of really good resource kind of think tank action groups that really deal with this. One of them is called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, ILSR. Um, they have been around for a long time. They both um, kind of catalog and support the emerging new economy, particularly in small town and rural areas, though not exclusively. Um, one of their senior staff, Stacy Mitchell, wrote the book Big Box Swindle and is one of the experts in the country around how do we create these new alternatives. Um, and so I would really recommend that Donna go to ILSR.org. Um, another author who's a good friend of mine is Michael Schumann, who writes a great deal, again, not, not limited to rural, but a lot of rural examples about some of the most interesting new ways to build strong, healthy, diverse economies, including how do we get capital in, in resource, so-called resource poor areas? How do we create our own base of capital? So I'd recommend Michael Schumann, S-H-U-M-A-N, and I'd recommend ILSR. And David uh, wondered where public education works into the causes of all this. He mentioned that since Reagan, all the way through Betsy DeVos, the education's been attacked. And the, there's assumption that the business model rather than public benefit, public service model is the way to go. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to say than what, what he said in that comment. I think that's under, that's one of the things underlying the attack on education is the long-term steady shift on, based on the idea that government's bad, private sector's good. Government can't ever get anything right. The private sector has the most innovative and efficient solution. We can disprove that all we want. It's a deeply ingrained part of our uh, American psyche at this point. And so that has its, takes its toll on, on public schools, to be sure. Another just interesting thing in that Catherine Kramer's experience in Wisconsin, you might recall that one of the big issues around Scott Walker was the fact that he was basically attacking the teachers union. And what she and that and 100,000 people came to the state capitol from all over. What she found among rural people was they didn't hate teachers, but they basically thought, well, shoot, I don't know what those teachers are complaining about. They got the summer off. They've got a pension. They've got health care. I mean, they do all right. They do better than me. And so again, teachers who have, make a very modest income for really critical work were seen by the people she spoke with as kind of part of that elite class who really had it pretty good, better than they did, and here they were complaining. So I mean, that's another, I think, element of, of how we might struggle, what we would face in trying to build support for public education. Linda Modica has something to say. Well, thank you, uh, Anthony. It was a terrific presentation. Thank you, Linda. Um, fascinated by the just transition um, aspect of of this, you know, and the um, in part after reading, and I'll sound elitist, I know, uh, by citing Arundhati Roy's um, 
article to to claim that it's to to give us hope that that the pandemic can be a portal and but also from the i appreciated anita's comments about about christianity in um in one of the worlds that i've been uh allowed into lately is the poor people's campaign mm -hmm. and it's um it's run by two two ministers one of whom's a bishop and um and it's um it's clearly founded or grounded rather in in um in their faith and in in the judeo-christian um, tradition in in of america and in the constitution and so i'm wondering about i'm wondering what you think about the the poor people's campaign um in and just a quick aside um with respect to to the way i just the way i see it this year being um with pope francis having called for a jubilee for the earth um there's a global catholic climate movement i don't know if you know of it but anyway um they are they too are working on plans for just transition and one of the ways that we see this playing out is by living laudato si which is the pope's uh, encyclical on on the climate and how that how that and together with the new encyclical fratelli tutti um that we're all connected and um and that we we need mutual aid we need we need um to recognize each other's needs and also the needs of of folks that we we um never hear from or or can't hear from because they they don't have a um a spokesperson and that's where i where i really do appreciate the poor people's campaign bringing up the needs of the uh, you know, uh, giving voice to the needs of the poor yeah which yeah. by the way includes rural farmers thank you yeah rural people um, in all kinds of occupations or struggling for occupations for sure. Um, you know, I think you pretty well said it, Linda. I'll just say a couple of things. Well, I absolutely um, have tremendous admiration for Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, and I'm delighted that the spark that he, that he lit some, what was it, four or five years ago in North Carolina, whatever it's been, has not been let go. It's been sort of not only continued, but organized and almost chaptered and affiliated. And I think that's good. I think right now, between now and, and the end of this election and the aftermath of the election, it's, it's essentially sidelined as most other things are, but I think it offers some hope for bringing us back together. I, I think looking at it from the, the lens of how do we get into this urban rural divide, um, what you would probably find from both the people I've spoken with and what I've read is that there wouldn't be a great deal of sympathy for the Poor People's Campaign, partly because it's been uh, substantially people of color, not exclusively, but substantially, especially in leadership and most visually, and because of how race has become so grotesquely embedded in all of these class issues and all these elite issues, um, it, it's gonna take some time to break that down, to see those folks as having the same common, you know, getting screwed by the same things that, that rural whites are getting hurt by. Uh, I do think that one of the ways to break through that is in the just transition movement. And um, some of you get the newsletter, I do know that I was part with about two dozen people of creating this national platform for um, economic transition for coal dependent communities in Appalachia and the Navajo Nation and elsewhere. And I don't know if that platform itself will be transformative, but I think it plays out a pretty good basic analysis of how these communities um, got robbed of, um, of resources and how to turn that around. If, we, if Joe Biden and Democrats and progressives more broadly made economic transition for people in, in fossil fuel dependent communities a centerpiece, of their economic strategy, 
number one, I think it's the right thing to do morally. Secondly, I think it would have great impact. But third, I think strategically from a political point of view, it would just make a heck of a lot of sense. I often use the example that when Obama came in, he had two things that directly impacted um, coal dependent communities. One was the power rule, which basically, which Trump has largely whittled away at, but which reigned in the amount of emissions from coal fired and other fossil fuel plants. Four years after that, four years after that helped, wasn't the only reason to create a extraordinary anti-Obama movement in coal country like ours. He put forward the Power Plus plan, which was um, a strategic plan to invest serious money in coal dependent communities to help them transition to new, healthier, more sustainable economies. I often wonder if he had put that investment in coal communities transition first and then the emission reduction requirement second, if, if there might have been some very different outcomes in a lot of ways. So I think, I think some focus on economic transition for communities in need uh, could go a long way. Anthony, Edgard and Philip uh, wanted to say something. Well, thank you. This is a wonderful talk. We're really enjoying it. Um, I wanted to touch on a little bit of something of um, what uh, Linda and Anita were talking about before um, was in researching about the urban rural divide, um, what kind of role do you think played in, um, I guess, with the evangelical movement um, and, re and religion and um, almost a, a sense that I, that I see sometimes is almost uh, the conservative movement is almost like, for lack of a better term, the Jesus party and um, you know, the Democrats are the evil baby, baby killers. And um, I, uh, how do you see how that, how that's played in um, to this divide? Yeah, I, I'm sure there's people who understand that question better than I do, Philip, but here's, here's my sense of it. First of all, in some respects, the rise of uh, evangelical Christianity as a political force really predates, I think, this very large schism between rural and urban. When, when Jerry Fowle talked about the moral majority and, and people of his ilk and stature within the religious community began to make this argument that ordinary Americans were not being heard um, and, and that in fact the, the country, the culture of the country, the language, the mores, and the laws were being driven by a small liberal elite. That was the beginnings of the anti-elite argument. It was couched in and driven by a specifically very conservative, very limited Christian kind of theological underpinning for sure, but it was the beginnings of that anti-elitism. And it was clearly identifying people in cities and Hollywood, the change makers, the people with the megaphone, the liberals as the ones driving things in the wrong direction. So I think it's played a critical role in, in little towns and rural communities like Southwest Virginia and all over the country. I think the two have just become so closely wed. Um, I think many of the, the preachers who lead small congregations and some, uh, some of the other leaders in those congregations have been so steeped in this kind of anti-urban, anti-elite thinking for so long now. I don't know that they preach it in their Sunday sermons, but I think it's taken as a given. And um, you remember the quote from the one woman who said, uh, speaking to Erica Edelson, it might seem surprising to you that people from the dominant religion and the dominant race could feel like they're under siege, but they do. And so I think, again, the roots of that, because it is kind of hard to fathom, but I think the roots of that start with Falwell and some of those early evangelical leaders who I identified a cabal of elites that are, are, that are steering the country in a bad direction. From there to QAnon, 
where substantial portions of America, 56% of Republicans, say they believe that QAnon is at least partly true. The idea that liberal elites are holding children as sex slaves, there's gigantic rings of pedophiles, even Satan worship and cannibalism. To, it's, it blows our mind to think who in the world could believe it, let alone more than half of the Republican Party. But it's a trajectory from those early statements and that early um, uh, kind of idea put forward by Falwell and others that we could get to this point. Thank you. Robert, you had something to say? Yeah, I love that this conversation went towards religion because I think um, it plays an important role. And I think the history that you've just placed, Anthony, of like the Christian right emerging with neoliberalism and gaining power and ultimately giving us strength um, is um, really important. I think part of that conversation is talking about well, what is the Christian left doing? And so we do see that with um, Reverend Barber and the, the Poor People's Campaign. But the Christian left has also had a long history of like a social gospel movement and, and really organizing. And I think that's emerging more and more. So I'm excited about that. Um, one of the questions that I do have though is this idea of who should we talk to most, Anthony? Should we talk to our neighbors or should we talk to urban um, urbanites? Because in one way, um, our neighbors may not hear this conversation and may um, not connect to some of the things that we're, we're saying, although they feel it and they deeply know it. Like, I do believe that. But in another way, um, people in urban communities, young people, um, people who have political power, might hear us out, might hear you out, right? And, and begin to shift themselves towards policies, a relationship with rural America, that rural America then can like maybe step up and also meet them. Because um, one thing that you're saying, and I, and I hope that people get this because I think it's really important, but Obama and Trump are the same. And um, when, um, and I'm a young person, maybe the youngest person on the call, um, and I campaigned and worked really hard to get Obama elected. Um, and of course, social justice wise, they're not that different either, but maybe there is. But economically, Obama was a neoliberalist and, and he um, um, bailed out the banks and Wall Street and totally forgot about it. So I hear you partly saying, we gotta kind of talk to the Obamas of the world. Um, and in fact, the Obamas of the world have a lot more power. And in my own conversations here um, in school, I hear a lot of people talking about race and class and trying to do something about race and class and wanting to have a sort of class analysis that really takes race seriously. But they imagine that they need to talk to rural people and Appalachians. And I get so frustrated because I'm like, white college educated folks voted for President Trump more than anyone else. And indeed, those people are as responsible or more so responsible than any rural community. So I'll put that out there to say, it seems partly that we can't ignore our urban friends and maybe you're gonna get into that on your next conversation, but how do we go about like bridging the gap from almost the top down in a way? Yeah. So. That's when I decided to take this approach uh, with these kind of community forums, the guidebook, I am speaking 99% to, to elites, <laughs> to, to liberals, to progressives who want a better world. Um, this part of it is not intended primarily for everyday working folks, rural folks, at all, I mean, except that there's plenty of educated elites in rural areas as well. My sense, Robert, is that part of what I'm hoping to do is to have an impact on the dynamic that comes from um, young and old liberal elites coming out who will learn some of, who first of all, number one, own the history of the Democratic Party and of liberal organizations and foundations and all of the support network as something that really has in word and indeed dissed a lot of people in this country, including a lot of rural people. First, we gotta own that. And that's where the economic analysis comes in. Then second thing, we've gotta look at 
how we've played into the narrative on the right that, that includes the evangelical right wing and others. And then the third thing, which we start on next week, is okay, if that's all true, how do we do this differently? So what I'm hoping is that the second half of this becomes in essence of a first attempt at enabling all of us to think about how we can be more effective communicators with our neighbors. I'm, I've done this one version of this another with Our Revolution Virginia, with a group in Northern Virginia and with some local democratic committees and other organizations. I'd, I'd love to do it once a week and just keep, keep kind of penetrating this. But, but I think everybody on this call, if you feel like you learned a thing or two and you feel like you have a, a, maybe a somewhat new understanding of this, I would say both try to practice that in your relationships with your neighbors, but use it to penetrate the liberal bubble. The liberal bubble is a huge part of our problem. And, and it's not an easy one to penetrate because for a lot of people, they so detest Trump, as I do, but they can't even begin to, to contemplate the idea of extending some empathy to Trump supporters. It's just, it's off the table for a lot. And so I think primarily to answer your question, I'm doing this to try to first speak to people in that liberal bubble so we can begin to change the way we act and the way we talk. We have, we have such a huge trust problem right now with working folks generally and with rural people in particular, and it ain't gonna change overnight. Again, again, we, we wouldn't have had Second Amendment sanctuary sweep through Southwest Virginia and across rural Virginia and other states. We wouldn't have the QAnon conspiracy so widely believed unless a pretty good chunk of people, including some of our neighbors, think that we're loathsome people, <laughs> think that we cannot be trusted, think that we're dangerous, think that we're perverted. And so undoing that is going to take some really new thinking and new acting. All right. It's 8.30. I think we said we would go from 7 to 8.30. Um, if you had a question, hold it <laughs> for next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And if you know somebody who you think would be interested in this conversation, invite them to join the Zoom next week. Bucky, Anthony? I'll, I'll say two things. One is... Um, I'm not quite sure how to do this, but I'm assuming the recording is going to be saved to my laptop. I will send you a link to it so that you can share it with the full invitation list. So somebody who, you know, maybe wants to join next week would certainly benefit from hearing this conversation. And the second thing is I think it'd be absolutely appropriate to start next week with whatever outstanding questions we didn't get to. That'll be kind of a way of recapping what we did this time. So let's let's allocate five to 10 minutes for that at the beginning, and then I'll move into my second presentation. Well, I know I suppressed one, so <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I can get that in next time. Thanks to everyone who uh, Zoomed in, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anthony. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Anthony. Bye-bye. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches.